Well, hello everyone. Welcome to this AES uh, Victoria seminar today. We're really thrilled to have Associate Professor Amy Gallickson as our speaker. Um, I should say good morning, good afternoon and good evening. I know we've got people joining us from around the world. Um, so thank you so much for, for taking the time to, to join uh, today's seminar. I believe we at least have people from the US, New Zealand, Australia, and I think a, a fairly large group from the Mongolian Evaluation Association as well. So, so welcome and it's just fantastic to have you um, joining this Victorian AES seminar. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands that we're hosting this AES seminar on today. Um, so that is the lands of the Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to the elders of those lands, past and present, extending that respect to future and emerging uh, cultural leaders, as well as um, extending that respect to anybody who may be joining us this morning who identifies Indigenous to Australia or around the world. Welcome. Okay. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things for this online webinar. As you can see, the session is recorded. Um, so hopefully you all feel okay with that. Um, we, we will keep the recording on for the duration of the session, um, including uh, to, to capture question and answers. Um, Amy has agreed to pause several times during her, her talk today to take clarifying questions. So because of that, we really welcome you to post questions in the chat um, during the presentation. And uh, at times when it's appropriate to take a pause, we'll be able to um, stop in and address your questions. There will also be time at the end um, prior to us finishing for you to ask further questions. But again, the chat is the best place for you to, to communicate with us throughout the session, um, just because of the size of the group. So, so please feel free to use that. Uh, yes, Esperanza, you've asked for the closed captions to be turned on. I think we can do that. Um, possibly. Just a moment. Mm, okay. Yes, I'm sure I can figure out how to do that. I might just start by introducing our speaker. Um, and hopefully I can I can figure that out shortly. So Look, today's uh, webinar, we are thrilled to have Amy Gallickson as our speaker, as I said. Amy is the Director of the University of Melbourne Centre for Program Evaluation. Um, the centre has been delivering evaluation and research services, thought leadership and um, training evaluators um, and giving qualifications to those evaluators for more than 30 years. She is also a co-founder and current chair of the International Society for Evaluation Education, um, a longtime member of the Australian Evaluation Society Pathways Committee and its predecessors, and a key architect um, and leader for the University of Melbourne's fully online multidisciplinary Masters of Evaluation program. That means Amy practices, teaches, and proselytizes evaluation as a transdiscipline, that is, as a discipline of its own and a tool used in many, perhaps all other disciplines. Um, her teaching and research are focused on creating clarity about what evaluation is and what a good evaluation looks like, credible, systematic, and useful determinations of merit, worth, or significance through the application of defensible criteria and standards to demonstrably relevant empirical facts. This means evaluation must surface performance and offer clear and transparent reasoning to arrive at judgments about how good that performance is. Following on from that, she is currently studying thinking about and experimenting with what people and organizations need to know and be able to do to deliver good evaluation. Amy does all of that because she's pretty sure evaluation is essential if we're going to save the world. I think I agree with her. Um, Amy is also a graduate of the interdisciplinary PhD in evaluation at Western Michigan University, where she learned the logic of evaluation from Michael Scriven, the program evaluation standards from Dan Stuffelbeam, and mainstreaming evaluation from Jim Sanders. She's a sociable introvert. Ask her about what she's reading or about the connections her brain is busy making among seemingly disparate things. So thank you so much, Amy. I'm gonna hand the floor to you and I'm really looking forward to your presentation. 
Thanks, Ruth. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to do this again online. So as Ruth said, I'm Amy Gillickson, and that was a super academic introduction, but you will find uh, this presentation is much less so. So I'm happy to be talking with you today about soul and maturity on being evaluators, which is for evaluators, but also um, for people who just dabble, I suppose, or deal with evaluation in different ways. So um, let me just find my way back to the screen where I've got this and there we go. I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional caretakers of a variety of lands. First, the Wurundjeri people whose land I'm on right now, which is in the region that I call Melbourne and where it's been my home for about 10 years now. So the Ghana people of Adelaide, whose lands hosted the AES 22 conference where I did this original presentation and the Lakota Sioux people of the land where I grew up in South Dakota in the United States. I pay respects to elders past, present and emerging and to any indigenous people with us today and those who might watch the recording. I'm deeply grateful for their tens of thousands of years of observations and knowledge about how our planet works and how people can live sustainably within its systems. And I hope the rest of us can learn to pay closer attention to their wisdom. I wanted to say thanks to AES and the AES 22 Conference Committee for the invitation to present and thanks to Ruth and the AES Victoria Regional Committee for the chance to do it again online. Uh, the ideas in this presentation aren't mine. They come from a variety of sources. My thinking has been informed by many conversation partners and observations throughout the conference and you know my practice in life. And so if I tried to list everybody uh, that I should thank about this presentation, it would take the whole time that I have allocated. <laughs> so instead, I'm just gonna say thank you to all those who have contributed. Uh, I just wanted to say something about why I'm doing this online. So um, I wanted to reprise the keynote in an online space because I'm concerned about equity in evaluation education. Um, and if you go to the IC website, you'll see that that's a place where we're also talking about it. Face-to-face -face conferences are great and they're great for connections and learning and they're really important to keep our professional organizations financially afloat, but they're expensive. And now that COVID's on the scene, it's risky for people who are immune compromised to do those kinds of events, no matter how um, vigilant we are about wearing masks and things. And so because of that, they end up excluding a lot of people. And I know I can't fix all the inequities in the system, but making this keynote public is something that I can do. And so that's why. Uh, as Ruth said, I'm happy to answer clarifying questions. And so you can just put those in the chat. Uh, throughout the time, I'm gonna pause a few times because I'm about to cover a lot of content. And it's important to get the first bit so that you can get the second bit. So if you have questions, please do put those in the chat and Ruth will, when I stop, Ruth will manage those for me. Thanks, Ruth. Have you been defeated by the closed captioning? Okay, yeah, so sorry, we don't have the closed captioning feature on this. Um, <clears throat> I'm not gonna make any promises about that, but I'll see what we can do to get that addressed when the recording goes up. So <clears throat> I wanted to, was, ever since I've come to Australia, I've been really just delighted by how our neighbors in New Zealand always introduce themselves by um, talking about where they're from and uh, geographically and also who their people are. So I thought I would do uh, a version of that <clears throat> about me for you. So you can see me here on the map. I'm the stick person with the curly green hair. So just prepare yourself because this is the quality of of graphics that you're gonna see <laughs> throughout the entire presentation. So um, my people originally came uh, from Norway and Germany about four generations before me and immigrated to the Midwest of the United States. And then in 2012, you can see that little green line that passes through, that's me uh, immigrating to Australia on my own in 2012. So my 10 year anniversary is in November. Um, my ancestry has a lot of farmers, uh, pastors, teachers, and homemakers. You can guess uh, which, which sick person is which of those kinds. Um, and when I was looking back through the generations of my family and, and noticing the kinds of professions people had, the thing that came through the most strongly 
because there was at least one in every generation was that home homemaker function that care that person who provides care uh, who feeds people who nurtures people who makes sure um, that they take care of the sick and who are present with the dying um, this is a hugely important role and the reason that I can uh, stand before you today in this online space is because there are lots of people taking care of all the people across all the generations of my family. And I think I've probably inherited a bit of that caretaker gene. And so I really see that there are powerful intergenerational forces in my family that are moving me towards positions where I can be responsible for helping other people to grow and develop. So now we're into the, the content of the presentation. And so I want you to meet this stick person who uh, is gonna represent a person or an organization uh, all throughout this presentation. So the ideas that I'm gonna discuss are gonna apply the same to persons and organizations. And a stick person was the best way I could think of to represent that. I'm also gonna talk quite a bit about soul and soul has a lot of meanings and I'm gonna use it in a particular way here. So I'm gonna explain that first. <clears throat> soul is very practical in the way that I'm gonna talk about it. It's about yourself. And so if the word soul feels strange or uncomfortable to you, just think about it as a self instead. It's about identity and purpose. I've drawn it here as a square, but with concave sides. So like swoop in. It's orange because this outline of the square is orange because it's the fire that's driving that person or an organization. But it has those concave sides because it makes points that reach out. And that's the fire of the thing that the soul wants to accomplish going out in different directions to accomplish that purpose. Um, when I talk about soul, I'm also talking about deeply held values. So the things that drive us, even if we don't talk about them as individuals or as organizations, they're at the core of what we do. They're at the core of what we think is important and why we're working to achieve the things that we're working for. So again, true for people and organizations. Souls are precious, but sometimes they're vulnerable. And so here I've drawn a more fragile soul with just a dotted line instead of a solid line. As individuals, we don't want people messing with our souls <clears throat> unless we find them quite trustworthy. And organizations are the same. So, you know, this is the core of what's important to you. Um, and it might be about your activity. It might be about your research discipline. It might be about how you think about evaluation. Um, but however that is, it's going to feel pretty precious. And if you're not very clear about what it is, it will probably feel even more vulnerable. And that's what that dotted line soul represents. So here I've attached soul to our stick person entity to show how they fit together. So you can see the soul is sort of like a cape. So the orange pointy bits attached to the arms and the legs and they align with that. So um, it sort of shows the energy of it with with the context of that stick person. And again, it can be that solid line or that dotted line, depending on how sort of clear someone is about what those core values are. So now when you add evaluation, which I've represented here with a little green checklist in the middle of the slide into an organization or as a human, if you add evaluation into our lives, often you get anxiety. And I've drawn that here as a big red A in a spiky, circle so the spikes are pointing out because anxiety is pretty prickly business and even though it's normal it can ramp up and then it gets to be really unhelpful so whenever we add a person and their soul or an organization and their soul and evaluation we're going to get anxiety for a couple reasons one is what i talked about already souls are pretty precious and we want to protect those <clears throat> the other is because evaluation activity takes away resources from doing soul activities. So if I have to spend money on evaluation, then I'm not spending that money or time or other resource on the things that my orange soul is driving me to do. So it's an opportunity cost that's real and having to do it can make people anxious. So if the organization's purpose and energy is dedicated to helping vulnerable populations, and I've shown those here as you know, a person with disability, perhaps someone who's elderly in, in aged care or children, then it's gonna be even more anxiety. And I've shown that with lots more of those anxiety spiky balls because vulnerable people are really important and it's important to us to get care for them right. We wanna do that well. And so uh, the anxiety around that is always increasing. 
So what, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how this works in a system a systems perspective. So when there's anxiety in the system, reactivity is the immediate response. So we have the anxiety ball here at the top. And at the bottom, I've drawn reactivity as a tornado or a cyclone, depending on where you're from in the world, with a tiny little fish next to it. Um, this is the symbol for what my family calls the frenzy piranha. So reactivity doesn't think, it just reacts. And it, it does a lot of stuff because when you're anxious, sometimes doing a lot of things will feel calming to start with. But ultimately what happens is it just makes more anxiety. So you can see here, I've attached that spiky ball um, to the anxiety ball with a, another closed arrow to make a loop. And so um, the way that this gets diagrammed in systems land is, uh, you have to think about how those two things affect each other. So if they're connected by that loop, you have you can have a plus sign at the end of the arrow or a minus sign at the end of the arrow. And you the, the plus doesn't mean more, it means same direction. And the minus doesn't mean less, it means opposite direction or balancing. So with plus, either they all go up or they all go down. And with minus, they go opposite so that it balances out. This is tricky because we, I, at least me as a person who grew up with Western math, plus means more. So it doesn't in this case. So the anxiety slash frenzy piranha loop that I've been drawing here is a reinforcing loop. And so you can see that from the plus signs. So that means they increase or decrease together. So if you, you've got anxiety that's going up, means you get more frenzy piranha, which means you get more anxiety, which makes more frenzy piranha. Da, 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 da. And so I've just made both of those symbols bigger to show how that increase reinforces and makes bigger and bigger of both those things. The good news is, and I've shown that here on the right hand side of the slide, that reinforcing works the other direction. So if something happens that allows anxiety or reactivity to come down, then you'll also get less of the other. So less anxiety, less frenzy piranha, less anxiety less frenzy prana. So we want to we want to make that reinforcing loop work in our favor, but it takes a little bit of shenanigans to make it happen. So when we add evaluation into this loop, we're also often just adding in another reinforcing thing. And so um, perhaps you've seen this, I know that I have, that increased anxiety increases reactivity, those frenzy prana, and then increases evaluation activities as a reactive response. So when this happens, you get, uh, like I uh, would talk to, to an organization recently that had 1,240 indicators, right? Huge. That's a, a, an, <laughs> an untenable amount. So you get things like that, hundreds of indicators, heaps of constructs, themes, variables, piles of program logics, lots of program theories, millions of dollars and hours and probably days or years of time spent internally and externally on data collection and analysis. And that time is invested not only by the organizations that are doing the evaluation, but by the people that they're intending to serve. So everybody is making a huge contribution to what may in fact be frenzy piranha activity. And what happens is that flurry of evaluation activity is reducing the resources that are available for soul activities. And so even if it's intended to be protecting of the soul, ultimately it has an effect of draining resources away from it. And that draining of resources will also just increase anxiety. So you can, I've added in here these many evaluation checklists to show that in the circle and another plus sign there to show that everything increases together. So this is a pretty, pretty significant problem. And I think, my hunch is that in 70 years since evaluation became a discipline that was gonna help tackle the world's problems, not much has shifted. And my hunch is that the reason that there's so little change when we have learned so much about evaluation and how to do it and make it useful is that we're in the middle of this frenzy, piranha, anxiety cycle, and we're increasing activity without necessarily increasing benefit. And so what I'm gonna talk about today is what happens if we reframe the situation from this perspective. But that was a lot of concepts. Oh, one more thing. If we acknowledge that organizations exist in emotional fields that can be riddled with anxiety. And so here we've got our, per our person or entity with a soul and they're surrounded by the spiky balls of anxiety. And that puts, we know that puts them in the middle of this 
frenzy, piranha, anxiety, evaluation loop, how do we respond? And I'm gonna suggest that our response is to, if, to deal with souls, to deal with evaluation and anxiety, our response could be maturity instead of just metrics. And so here on the slide on the right hand, I've added in the symbol for maturity, which I'll explain more in the next section. Um, and I've also added a question mark because we wanna see what happens if we put that in the, in the system. So do we get a plus sign or do we get a minus sign at the end of those arrows? So is maturity gonna be a thing that just keeps increasing the anxiety and the evaluation and the frenzy piranha, or is it gonna be something that kind of helps balance things out? Now I'm gonna stop. And if there's questions in the chat, because that was a lot of big ideas in a short amount of time. So please ask if you don't understand something. There's, there's no questions yet, Amy, but perhaps we can pause for a moment. Or if you if you have a question, pop it in there. Don't be shy. Please don't. It actually makes me nervous when no one has questions. Because <laughs> I'm pretty sure I don't explain things that clearly. Oh, thanks. Liam is personally engrossed. Thanks, Liam. <laughs> Hi, Liam. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go, assuming that we're... Okay, flag me, Ruth, if something comes up that needs to be clarified. <clears throat> so next, let's talk about what is maturity. So maturity is based on the entity, that person or organization, our sick person, and how they function. I have represented it here as a, the sick person inside a bubble. Um, and so you can see the arms and the legs of the person and their head, like they're filling up the whole bubble. And that's because responsibility is the ability to hold tension. So it's about the person or the organization holding their own tension. So there's things that they're worried about or they might need to do and they're managing that themselves. Um, but they're not going outside that bubble, they're staying in it. They're responsible for their own emotional being and destiny. And so that's why the circle's quite close, right? They've got their own space covered. They're not small, they're not big, which I'll talk more about in a second. So they're holding their own tension and they're not holding anybody else's. I'll explain more about that as we go. Also remember that this is really about soul and protecting soul and ensuring that that soul can do what it needs to do, right? So it's that fire that's pushing out. Um, and so I've drawn the soul over the person in the entity, but there's about to be a bazillion different stick figures and colors and stuff. So I'm just gonna take that out. So it's one less thing on the slide to make it so busy. Um, but I just want you to remember the soul is always in there, even if I haven't drawn it. So how can we understand how maturity functions? So here we've got our mature person or organization in their bubble in the middle of this slide. And they're in a field of anxiety spiky balls. And some of those spiky balls are sticking into the bubble of our mature person. And so anytime anxiety starts poking, either us as a person or poking uh, organizations, a couple things can happen. First, the re first response can be over-functioning. So in this case, the person or organization stretches responsibility out past their bubble and gets into things that are really other people's responsibility. So they try to take on um, a role to help other people manage their, be their own being and destiny. So I've just drawn that as this person whose arms and head and legs are sticking outside the bubble. And let me just give you some examples of what this looks like. So classically, it's international development organizations who think they know what other countries need, and then they try to provide it by bringing in their own team to manage the problem. Uh, in your house, it might be parents who are chasing up kids to do their own schoolwork. It might be bosses who micromanage or to take responsibility, um, a, like they've delegated a project, but then they take the responsibility back. I am certainly guilty of that from time to time. Or often it can be evaluators who tell clients how to make decisions <clears throat> or implicitly, like not with, without sort of naming it, they impose their own values into the evaluation process. So um, this is about any time you're sort of out of your bubble and trying to solve other people's problems that really belong to them to solve. And that's again, personal or organization. So anytime the anxiety or stress goes up and I've just put more anxiety bubbles in here, and those spiky balls, and the more they get stuck into that entity's bubble 
an overfunctioner will respond by getting even bigger, by overfunctioning even more. And so here I've made the person larger to show that really at this point, the only thing that's left inside their maturity bubble is the middle of their body. <laughs> Everything else is outside the bubble. And uh, as a person who overfunctions as a default, I can tell you that this is not a good scenario for anybody. So that's the overfunctioner. <clears throat> Underfunctioning is the opposite. So this is any time a person is in an anxiety field and they get those anxiety spiky balls stuck into their bubble, they actually become less responsible for their own being and destiny. And so I've drawn that here with this person who's small inside the same size bubble. So you can see there, there's a big circle of white around them and their arms and legs have a lot of space between where they are in the bubble and where the bubble is. So what does this look like in life? So in an organization, it might be that they're passive. Um, you know, they're in a sector that needs to grow, but they don't want to take a risk. And so they're avoiding conflicts that would help to make that happen. It can be in communities that allow others in to define and solve their problems rather than figuring out what they need to do um, on their own and using their own resources to do that. Uh, in marriages, it sometimes looks like somebody who makes all the decisions and somebody who lets them, but then is grumpy about it. Um, kids who don't want to do their homework is another classic. Uh, employees who don't want to do their work or just do it badly so that someone else will pick it up. And in evaluation, I think, or research, it's quite often we have, um, we have this idea that we're going to go in and bring our questions to the communities and then take the data out, which we say is to solve the community or problems or to help them, but we don't engage with that community in any way. We really are staying well inside of our bubble and not um, interacting in a way that would actually be beneficial to the community. So again, when the anxiety goes up with the, which I'm showing here with the more sp extra spiky balls, <clears throat> the underfunctioner will get even smaller. They will respond by even, by being even less responsible. And so you can see I've made the person tiny. So it's, it's passivity. It's not being connected. You can't connect to anybody if you're not touching the edge of your bubble. And you're expecting the underfunctioner will expect that um, someone else will pick up the slack when there's a lot of anxiety. And often they're right because the world is full of underfunctioners who are just looking for the opportunity to do that so they don't have to manage their own stuff. So now we've got uh, maturity in the middle uh, and with the person who's just touching the edges of their bubble. The underfunctioning person is on the left hand side with a small as a small stick figure inside of their bubble and the overfunctioner stretches out beyond their bubble. <clears throat> and just a reminder that the orange is that soul. <clears throat> and my hunch is, I'm based on reading, not just me thinking, is that the, those, the underfunctioner and the overfunctioner are probably a bit less clear about what they're about. So that's why they have the dotted line of soul instead of the solid line that the mature person has. And so um, all this again can be true for people and for organizations. I'm stopping again for questions. Uh, no questions yet, just positive comments. <laughs> um, particularly one okay. from Lindy, who's loving the personal and human reflection rather than an academic reflection on evaluation. <laughs> well, whenever I've talked about these concepts in an academic way, people's eyes just glaze over. So I thought, right, let's let's get out the stick people. They're always more fun for me too. Okay, so let's talk about what maturity looks like. <clears throat> it has three parts, focus on self, staying connected and getting curious. So here we've got our maturity person with their well-defined soul, filling up their bubble as they should. <clears throat> this slide's about the first uh, principle, which is focus on self and managing self. So here what I did was just make a mirror image copy of the person in their maturity bubble. And I put a magnifying class between the two of them just to show that that's a focus on self. It's that self-reflection and self-examination. <clears throat> so that means when anxiety shows up, which, you know, we've got the spiky balls of anxiety and we even have a little frenzy piranha inside the bubble of the mature person. Look out, frenzy piranha. That means when that all starts to happen, and this is again true for organizations and people, that you manage your own frenzy piranha, you figure out how to deal with your own anxiety and you just keep focusing on your own being and destiny. 
So um, you just really, you get out that magnifying glass and you look at yourself and you think about, okay, what, you know, what's coming at me? How do I manage this? How do I stay responsible only for my own being and destiny? Um, and you're always sort of monitoring that. So that's an ongoing thing because the only way to keep from getting too small or too big is to really pay attention to how well you're functioning in that space. So that's thing one. Thing two is about this, this slides, the second part of maturity and it's staying connected. So here we have the mature person. Obviously this is us, right? We're the mature person in the middle. Uh, we are just touching the outside of our bubbles, but our bubbles are connected on the right and the left to the person who's under-functioning and the person that's over-functioning. And so this shows that second principle of relationship and connection. So those, those touching bubbles are us interacting as a mature person with these other people. And it's really important to do that, particularly with people who increase your anxiety. Perhaps you have some of those. Because um, it provides a really great laboratory to practice staying in your bubble. So it might not be pleasant, but it's really good practice. I don't like it, but I get to do it a lot. So when there's anxiety around, wh wh what do you think will happen? Obviously, the dang overfunctioners are going to try to get in your bubble and solve your problems, right? They want to do things for you because they don't want to deal with their own stuff. <clears throat> and the underfunctioners are going to get smaller and smaller, and they're going to try to lure you into doing things for them. So here we've got the anxiety around and your frenzy piranhas with you inside your bubble, mature person. But your goal is simply not to feed your frenzy piranha, even if you have a little one in your bubble, right? They're not your friends. <laughs> so don't feed them and make them a pet. <clears throat> so this slide is about the last part, the third part, getting curious. And so here I've got you, again, obviously the, you're the mature one. In the bubble, you have large rabbit ears, a magnifying glass, and some question marks. And all of those three features are both inside and outside your maturity bubble. This is on purpose. So you're staying in your bubble, but you're, you've got your antenna out. You're listening, you're watching, you're observing, you're asking so that you can learn as much as you can about the situation, about yourself, and about the people that you're connected to. So anytime anxiety goes up, so our anxiety spiky balls are back, um, in you, in the space where you are, or um, in the people that you're interacting with or connected to, you just listen and look harder. So that's that combination of self-reflection, but also really intensely engaging with what's happening around you. So um, to show how that increases, I've made the bunny ears and the magnifying glass and the questions double the size, right? So anxiety happens and you just get more intensely curious instead of letting feeding the frenzy prana or um, dealing with that increased anxiety that way. So on this slide, we're back to the mature person in the middle, bunny ears, magnifying glass, questions. And I know that they look a little bit silly here when they're attached to the perfectly normal looking overfunctioner and underfunctioner. But the advantage of this is that when that person or entity of any kind, organization, can stay in their bubble, can manage themselves, can stay connected, and can get even a little bit curious, the anxiety floating around is gonna reduce. And I've showed that by the anxiety balls um, getting smaller. And it's all of them. It's not just the ones that are stuck into people's bubbles, um, yours or other people's. So that's the magic of how systems work. If even one person or organization can change their functioning just a little to manage themselves, to be curious and to stay connected. So only three things, it will affect every entity in the system even those that, the, uh, that you as that mature person aren't connected to. So um, if there's somebody, for instance, attached on the left-hand side of the underfunctioner, on the right-hand side of the overfunctioner, and they're feeling anxious, their anxiety will also go down. It's logical. So what if a response to dealing with souls evaluation and anxiety was maturity instead of metrics. So I've just reprised that slide that has that mature person in our loop of anxiety and frenzy piranha and evaluation. So, and I've left that as a question mark, but I think what we can say is that maturity does balance the system. So when anxiety goes up and maturity also goes up, 
then the frenzy piranha of reactivity goes down. And because the piranhas and the anxiety go in the same direction, if the piranhas go down, anxiety goes down. So it's a way to balance things out instead of just all the time increasing. I'm stopping again. Still no questions, Amy. Okay. <laughs> so feel free right. to go. And I thumbs I'm going to have a drink while you think about writing things. Actually, we've just got one from Liam, um, and I'll repeat it for the recording. Liam posted, I'm thinking about how applicable this thinking might be in terms of um, aspects like developing leadership. Is this something that you've thought about? Uh, yeah, well, not me. I mean, yes, but there's a great book in the, my slides at the end. There's a book called Failure of Nerve by a guy named Ed Friedman who talks about this stuff exactly in the leadership context. So you could go read Ed, which I totally recommend. And yes, it is hugely important for leadership. Yep, just a couple more, Amy. Yep. Um, how would these principles of maturity apply to organizations, James has asked. Oh, hi, James. And uh, let me talk a little bit, I'll talk about that next. And then I'll come back to that question, James, if you feel like I haven't answered it. And just one more from Karina, which you might touch on more as well. Um, she's asked, don't you still need measurement, but less driven by anxiety and more driven by curiosity? It's like you're prompting me to talk about my next section, Karina. Thanks. Anything else? No, nothing else. Okay, perfect. Karina, you're about to get your question answered. So what does this look like in practice? Hmm. So here we have our mature person. In this case, it's an evaluator, obviously, because we're talking about evaluation practice, but you can replace that with any other kind of person you'd like. That's since this was for an evaluation conference, I'm talking about evaluators. So what have we thought of our job as evaluators as helping organizations clarify their values and purpose, the reason that they exist. And so I've shown that clarification as the, that move from the soul with the dotted line to a, being a soul with that clear, um, really strong, robust line. Um, I connected them with an arrow, but look, it's not gonna be that linear. It's gonna be one of those things. It's like a ball of hair in the middle where you sometimes get it and sometimes you don't. So um, that process of moving from a dotted line to a solid line and getting more clarity is gonna be a bit messy, but still worth doing. So then when, as evaluators, our questions and observations are gonna be focused on how that process is going of getting from lack of clarity to clarity. And so I've added in a question mark and a magnifying glass between the uh, dotted line soul and the solid one to just show that we're engaged with that and we're, our questions and observations are about that process. We'd be listening all the time because what we wanna hear about is what they value and what they think is important. And we also want to reflect that back to them. So we hear it and then we say things like, did we hear that correctly? And do you really mean that? Because sometimes people will make statements and then they think about it and say, well, you know, it turns out maybe there's something else that's more important. And so in this slide, I put the bunny ears in between the dotted line and the solid line sold to just show that extra listening. Our observations and reflections with them on soul could also help them identify where they're over-functioning or under-functioning. And so um, here I've just put both those um, representations of the over-functioner and under-functioner in here, because the odds are as an organization that that's probably happening, that there's one or the other and asking about it and observing about it and, and being curious about it as a way to help them reflect on it. We would also be observing, inquiring, and listening to see where the level of anxiety is in the organization and in their sector and what kind of responses are happening so they can see if frenzy piranhas are on the scene and how much frenzy piranha activity is happening. So here we've got that progression from the dotted line soul to the, um, the solid line soul. And I've just put that in the middle of the anxiety frenzy piranha loop with us again as the evaluators on the outside we're observing that carefully and reflecting that back to them so when we put ourselves in the system as evaluators as at this non-anxious presence that's managing ourselves staying curious staying connected um, we can help the system calm down so that organizations can be clear about what their work is 
and then focus on it. So here I've just, again, put that arm, the mature person into the cycle. So they're balancing things out, calming the system down and um, making it possible for that soul to develop a bit more clarity. When the system's calmer, then we can thoughtfully bring in all the other stuff, um, Karina, that you mentioned. So we can think about evaluator competencies. What are the things that we know that, um, that can be useful to them? We have heaps of tools. I think Michael Quinn Patton just did a thing that found 100 evaluation approaches or something. This might be a sign of frenzy prana activity, but that's a different presentation. Um, so we got all kinds of things that we can use but we have a better chance of using them when the system's calmer because we'll be able to make better choices and the organization will be better able to say, oh, you know what, this is what we really need. So that, that when the energy's calmer, everything can just uh, proceed with a bit more um, clarity. So when we're functioning this way as evaluators, it also might mean that the accuracy of our maps and our program theories might be less important and they also might be less linear so here I've put kind of that classic program logic in the bottom of the slide with the boxes and the arrows. And next to it, I've just drawn, uh, you know, all the same stuff connected to each other in all kinds of ways to show the difference between those two things. So um, this messier system that's on that left-hand bottom corner is really a rough diagram of how things work that you can update as you go, but it also is focusing on observation. And I've put the anxiety spiky ball and the frenzy piranha in the system because we want to be paying attention to that. That's really important information about where are people feeling anxious, where is the organization feeling anxious, um, what kinds of activities are happening that might not actually be fruitful in terms of pursuing the organization's, um, you know, soul, their purpose. And so um, if we stay in that observation role, we can also use our tools in a rougher way to help do that. So rather than investing in making a perfect program logic, which we all know doesn't exist, uh, and trying to persuade clients <laughs> that they don't need a perfect program logic, we can just say, look, this thing's gonna be messy and let's just keep it messy because that rough thing uh, will make it easier for us to change things around. It's also gonna change the questions that we ask and the kinds of data that we'll collect. So here I've put in all of those uh, checklist little um, icons, but I've connected them to the soul with some arrows. So what we're doing is we're, we're collecting data, but we know what we want and we know how to make better sense of it because we've decided what's important and we've decided that based on how it relates to the soul and the purpose of the organization that we're working with. So um, helping them do their own thinking is also really important. So our job here is to provide expertise to them to figure out how to track how they're going, to make sense of the data that's coming in, and to manage their own selves in terms of their bubble. So we want to help them get clear about the core of their being and doing. So for our, for our role, it means that we can potentially be more focused but not in a develop a thousand indicators way, but in a, what do we pay attention to? Which is how well is the organization staying in its bubble? What does the anxiety look like? What kind of frenzy piranha activity is happening? Um, what is it that they wanna know and, and do? What are they existing for? What's the fire that's driving them? And so when we're in that space and the organization's getting that clarity about soul, then integrating into evaluation into their work to figure out how they're going um, will help understand what the relationships, the products and the outcomes they're trying to create. And so I've shown here, I've just moved all the stuffs over to them. So the organization itself has the uh, evaluation in their hand, the little sign for metrics, and they've got the messy program logic in the other hand, because this is their stuff and we're just helping them work through it. So I'm not gonna ask questions because I'm almost done, but I, I wanted to just finish by saying, so this is a completely different way of, of thinking about how we do our work as evaluators and uh, why should we bother with changing this? Is it that important? Uh, and this slide is intentionally left blank. So um, in the middle of this year, you know, we've had, I was reflecting on 
fundamentally how hopeless I felt as a human. So we've had a plague or, or two, if you count monkeypox, um, increasing evidence of catastrophic climate change, which is affecting the most vulnerable people in our world. We got nationalism, like I'm from the US, we had Donald Trump. Um, we got instant news cycles, we got, uh, population issues, um, people, cities that don't have water. Um, we've got clear signs that governments are failing and social systems are, are not working. We're deluged in data and in maps, but it feels to, it felt to me like we didn't know who we are or where we are. And I, it made me feel really hopeless. Um, yeah, but then I was reminded of Western world history in the book that I mentioned, Liam, the Ed Friedman book. He talks about how in the 1400s in Europe, they'd had the plague, feudalism, nationalism, and then all kinds of wars happening between these little feudal states. And the slide here is a map from the 1400s. And I think the title that usually gets put on it is Here There Be Dragons. So it was simply not safe to leave your little corner of the world because if you walked outside of your sort of small geographic area, you would certainly encounter a monster of some kind and probably not survive. These are the same maps that had the world is flat and boats like falling off the edge into the mouths of monsters. So they're in the same kind of mental place, I think, that we potentially could be right now. And yet from that era, it launched the Renaissance. So art, um, people who are going out and exploring, let's be clear, the colonizing bit was terrible, but the spirit of the time was really important. And that was adventure, creativity, curiosity, energy. And I think we're at a similar moment now. And evaluation and evaluators can help kick off a renaissance if we can shift our paradigm to this thing where we understand how we function in the system in relation to anxiety and frenzy piranhas. So if, if what our job is, is to focus on souls and to help them make that progression from um, unclarity to clarity, and to help organizations clarify their responsibilities, their purpose, their values. And if we can do it by working to stay in our maturity bubbles, be connected and be curious, then our presence in the space will create clarity and reduce the energy spent on frenzy piranha activity and set it free for adventure and exploring. And so I've replaced competencies in this diagram with the um, boat, a brown boat and a blue lightning bolt. So the blue lightning bolt's energy, woo, and the brown boat is exploration. And so if we walk through the cycle again, you can see, so if anxiety goes up, maturity goes up, frenzy piranhas go down, and then energy and adventure go up, and then anxiety goes down again. So I just also want to say this isn't going to happen overnight. The maturity bit, I'm now 51. I've probably been actively working on it for 20 years, and the progress is slow, I can tell you. So uh, in this, I, for us, for the organizations that we work with, we have to just keep in mind that this isn't a fast process. And so I would suggest that we need to be a little bit more like my Norwegian and German, German farmer ancestors. We need to do our work, just keep doing it, be faithful and watch and see what happens. And then we might need to do some weeding, but you, no one's ever made a plant grow by pulling on it. You just gotta be patient while it does its thing. So every time we work to stay inside our maturity bubble as evaluators, to be curious, to listen, to focus on values and soul, what's really important for those organizations. We're reducing anxiety and making a bit more space for energy and curiosity and creative responses to the challenges of our planet and all the living things that are on it. And that's, I think, how evaluation might help save the world. Thanks. And I think the slides are up, but uh, right, you can always come study with us at Melbourne. We'd love to have you. And um, I did at the end of my slides, I've got the Ed Friedman book and other things that you could read. Now Thank you, you so much, Amy. You're welcome. Um, I really enjoyed that. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure others have too. And there was a couple of clapped hands as well. So th thanks, thanks for that. Mm. Um, we do have time for comments, reflections and questions. So please, um, 
feel free to, to post in the chat or I think perhaps we could even do the raise hand function now that we're we're towards the end. So if you would like to just say something out loud, um, please feel free to raise your hand and I'll uh, call on you. I think Karina raised her real hand. Ah, Karina, <laughs> go ahead. I couldn't see the function, so I just had to go the old fashioned way. Um, Amy, that was just amazing. I heard it at, that at the conference and found it absolutely probably the best speak, uh, presentation I've seen for a very long time. So thank you so much for that. Um, I just wanted to ask you, I mean, in the new world, it's, it sounds like it's really about a mature person who is, um, sorry about that bit of a bang there, as a mature person who's, who's, who's listening and curious, and I'm just thinking about the traditional role of the evaluator. I mean, it's sort of, it's sort of suggesting that it doesn't have to be the role of the evaluator is to somebody who has traits of curiosity and listening and maturity. Just wanted to run that past you, get your thoughts. Yeah. So anybody can be mature. And I, I think I my impression of how the spaces we end up in as evaluators is that organizations have anxiety around a thing. And one of the ways they deal with it is to shift it to a consultant of some kind, which is often us. Or if you're an internal evaluator, then the organization will try to shift that anxiety to your function instead of owning the work. And so um, how we manage ourselves in that space makes a huge difference to whether the anxiety goes up and whether they learn actually how to manage their own anxiety. So I think that's, for me, it's fantastic when you've got a mature leader in an organization, all of the um, literature around that, which is what's in that Ed Friedman book, is uh, if the leader can function in a mature way that's clear, it actually calms the whole system down in the organization. So it's fantastic. Um, but we're not counselors, right, or therapists. We're just people who know some things about data. And so um, working on ourselves is really, I think, the way that we can, can do that. Because quite often, if you function that way, it, it's also catching and people become more mature kind of by association because our bubbles are watching. Stephanie's hand is raised next, Amy. See, hey, Stephanie Button. Hi. Hi, Amy. Thanks for that. That was really interesting. I was just reflecting as you were talking on the two layers of an organization's soul versus the actual individuals that, I mean, particularly an external evaluator is interacting with and in a sense like I can, I can see the argument or the usefulness of conceptualizing the organization's soul, but at the same time, the organization isn't a thing. Like it's just people yeah. who are ne not necessarily going to have all the same. You know, I've often worked with people where there's a the sort of handful of key individuals that you're working with on an evaluation or another project all have different values and vision mm -hmm. and like a huge amount of the difficulty comes from the fact that they're not in sync Yep. Um, creating a lot of anxiety and tangle. So how does your kind of recommendation work on that level when there is no like one soul to kind of help people uncover? Mm -hmm. What a great question. Thanks, Steph. Um, so I think part of it is acknowledging that that's a thing. You know, we all have different values in the space if you're in that kind of team. And to to call that out as a something that's actually impeding progress and to talk about what that means. Because I think quite often we tend to function around that as if it's not real and it's not having consequences. And so I think that's something actually that in our role as evaluators, we can do to say, look, evaluation's about what's important to you. And it seems like we got a whole mix of things that are differently important to different people. So can we put that all out in the world? Like, can we have a conversation about what's important to you and why, so we can see how those things relate to each other. Because I, I find um, my students that have been doing like thesis research and PhD of varying, varying kinds uh, are in nonprofits. And so maybe they're a bit more 
you know, people are in that space for a particular reason. I think it might be more challenging in organizations like government where that's not necessarily the case. <clears throat> but I think that value conversation still stands is really important because if you can't, you're always going to be spinning in that anxiety frenzy prana place if you can't talk about what's important and why it's actually causing people to do things that are making more anxiety. Yeah, thank you. That made me think of the stuff you've written about making values explicit. I'm just um, contemplating the, the kind of danger zone between facilitating conversations between people in conflict to make their different values explicit and getting just drawn into this morass of interpersonal yeah. conflicts within an organization. Right. Well, and part of that for us, I think, is having a clear sense of that's in our like what's in our bubble. You know, where can we be helpful in observing or reflecting uh, back to them what we see? And where is this outside of our space? And, and we might say, look, you need someone who does mediation or conflict management or whatever. But what we can do is surface that that might be needed. You know, it doesn't mean that we need to be the ones that do it. And that's part of us staying in our bubble. We might observe that they've got, my goodness, <laughs> you have some pretty significant conflicts in here and if you can't work those out then you're not going to be able we're not going to be able to do the things together that you want to do so you know it's it, it, because if we can't identify that I mean as consultants right that's nice for us like we can just keep making money while they don't work their stuff out but um fundamentally I think our our ability to observe and and tell them that reflect back to them what we're seeing is really important Oh, two more. <laughs> um, should we go to you, Erin, and then and then James? Sure. Um, thank you, Amy, for the presentation. It was very interesting. I didn't get to go to the conference, so um, thank you for making this available to us. Um, I was thinking about anxiety and frenzy piranhas and how many of those I encounter, and then also my own um, frenzy piranha and anxiety, um, which I think it also you know, feed into the whole, you know, the whole maturity thing really is about our own um, presence and how we, um, you know, it, it, I guess, introduce ourselves into organizations as well when we're working with them. But one of the things I, I see a lot, and I'm sure you do too, is that um, a lot of this um, kind of circular effect, uh, you know, is really fed by uh, the way, particularly nonprofits are funded. Um, to deliver miracles in a very short amount of time. And so I see a lot of like, you know, even metrics um, before I go in, you know, starting to design evaluations with people that have already been set up by the funder um, that have, you know, kind of very high expectations. And then the people I'm working with are like pulling their hair out going, how am I going to do mm -hmm. this? And we're trying mm -hmm. to set things up so that they can, you know, demonstrate their achievements, but knowing already that they may not meet them at all. So I'm wondering how we, you know, kind of use these concepts in that kind of environment where, you know, people are kind of um, almost kind of set up in a way to um, yes. feel like they're gonna fail to start with it. Yeah. Well, and not only set up to feel like they're gonna fail, but probably well, to fail. Yeah. yeah. So again, again, I think that observation is really important to say mm -hmm. that you know, that this, this ability to look at the thing and say, this is what I see, does that feel like that to you, is probably one of the most powerful things I would like people to take away from this conversation. Because it's saying that, right, you've named the thing, you know, and so when you name it, then it has less power to sort of make everybody crazy. And then you can think about, okay, well, how are we going to deal with this? So what kind of flexibility do we have with the funder? Can we go back to them and say, look, you know, we have X amount of dollars to do this thing. So how much of it do you want us to spend on doing evaluation stuff? And how much of it do you want us to spend on this? Are there things that are more important or not? And if they won't play ball, then you, you make those decisions. I mean, it sort of creates a sense where people can be self-defining or the organization can be self-defining about what's important. And it will help them navigate that because it might mean that they don't wanna take money from that funder again in the future if they can help it. And it might spark looking for money elsewhere that could be a bit more flexible. So I think it's part of it's opening up options instead of just 
spinning in the circle. So anything you can do that can increase the number of potential responses to a situation will also help decrease that reactivity because you're not thinking, well, we have to do the things, all the things. You're thinking about, okay, well, what if we can't do all the things? <laughs> you know, then what else can we do? Or are there ways to do the things that aren't gonna be so resource intensive? Does that help? Does that feel real as a useful? It, 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 I think it is helpful. I mean, I think the approach is very, very helpful. I do think that, um, you know, a lot of these organizations don't have options. And so their funding is limited, you know, even, you know, to, you know, the government agency that's funding them, but they are completely reliant on that. But I think what you're saying is important about opening up these conversations, even, you know, you know, with um, the, the, the client or with the, the funder or together around, you know, what is realistically achievable here in a mature, you know, in a way that is, you know, protecting what is really valuable here in the organization. I think the other thing, sorry, James, I promise I'll come to you. I think the other thing is the connect, you potentially, I feel like nonprofits often are kind of competing with each other because you're getting, right, you're fighting for money from the same kinds of places. But if, if, the, if you all could connect with each other and say, are you struggling with the same things we're struggling with? And what would a good solution look like? you know, for the, your sector or that particular kind, that's another way to open up some possible responses. So if you think about connection as a way, connections that you haven't made, um, and, and you can do that in a way that, you know, everybody feels kind of safe, because, you know, you're not risking each other's stuff, but you're saying, look, we're really struggling. And usually that means somebody has to go first and say that, you know, and it might be in casual conversations because you know somebody in another organization that does the things. I feel like nonprofit people kind of move around um, from place to place. So there's probably a lot of personal connections that would make that possible where you could have that conversation without having to like make an announcement, you know, <laughs> my organization's having a shit time with these particular indicators or whatever. But thinking about those connections can be really um, useful. In, in thinking about possible responses. James, I know we're a little bit over, but I don't mind. No, no problem. So thanks for that, uh, Amy, for a really good uh, presentation. It made me reflect a lot on what my role is as an internal and an external evaluator. I guess I'm just coming back to my original question in terms of what organizations can do to build maturity themselves, because I'm yeah. kind of thinking that it's us up to us as evaluators to actually clarify their uh, maturity. But I also feel that if organizations can also build their own maturity um, themselves without supporting them, I think that might be even better. Yes, I agree 100%. And I think the it really depends on thinking about what kind of, if you're the evaluator, internal or external, what sort of access do you have to leadership to have a conversation about this? Okay. Um, I certainly don't think it's our responsibility on our own. I just think it's a thing we can help with. Yeah, okay. But if the organ, it's really the organization's job, right? So it's us staying in our bubble and being curious about it. It's not us getting into their business and trying to be their organizers or their value articulators. Yeah. So there's, um, but I think talking with people in your organization about the difference between what a mature organization could look like and what an, a less mature organization could look like is a way to start that conversation. Okay, yeah, that's a good idea. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. Um, Amy, I'm just seeing a lot of people needing to head off. Are you happy for people to email you if they've got of to course. go? Great. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I think uh, my email is on the slides. So you can certainly ping me there if you've got questions. Oh, look, Ruth, you're already ready, of course. My email address. I didn't want to post it if you disagreed. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, I changed my mind. Hi, Charles. Oh, oh you're just... muted. You're muted. Thank you for the presentation, really enjoyed it. Um, so some authors have um, related um, evaluation with power imbalance. Um, and so I wondered what well, your thought uh, around how the concept of anxiety in evaluation is related to power imbalance, if power imbalance um, kind of promotes that whole 
um, system of anxiety? And also, how does maturity help to you know, suppress this power imbalance within that evaluation space? Right. Well, not a small question for first thing in the morning, but a really good one. Thanks, Charles. Um, so the over-function or under-functioner thing for me is the way into understanding that or one of the ways in. So if you think about power imbalances, and they're, I'm not saying they're not real because they are. And, and I think what Aaron talked about with the uh, nonprofit funding is a great example of that. Like people have money and nonprofits need the money. And so you're in that space of trying to figure out what to do about it when they have unreasonable expectations. Um, so if you're a person or an organization and sort of a low power situation, understanding what work is your work and understanding what work belongs to other people can be really helpful. Um, having some clarity about what you would do or not do can also be really helpful. So that working on defining of self for a person in a low power position will often lead to things um, like I suggested. You can start to think about, okay, well, if I don't wanna do this thing that they're requiring me to do, what are my options? What, you know, what are the possibilities I have to sort of navigate around that? And then you start to think about what are the resources I have to build on? What are the strengths that we have as a community, for instance, or as an organization that would let us be able to do what we want because we're clear about what that is, um, either without the funding of that person or to use, to get clever about how you do the thing within the rules and the rules that of that funding organization, for instance. So um, the focusing on maturity of self ends, means that you start to have more possible responses to that power situation that can help diffuse it. But it will not be a simple task, which you already know. Yeah. Thank you. Lots of thanks for you, Amy, in the chat. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I really would love to, like this, Aaron and, and Charles, both your questions are really important. And so I feel like that's the sort of thing that gets worked out through connection with each other. You know, how are you tackling this? How are we thinking about it? You know, what things have worked for you? What things haven't? Um, so conversation with people who are in the same space can also be really important to think because it just helps you see more options if you've got colleagues who are doing, facing similar challenges. 